title of my talk is uh, <laughs> from uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich and Karen uh, just dispelled the obvious. I will not be talking about uh, our colleague Karen's <laughs> take on Hegel, not this time. Um, uh, rather, the name Karen in the title refers to stereotypical character that emerged in the internet culture in recent years, but more on that later. Now to begin, in order to anchor my presentation more firmly to the topic of the conference, I will present my own take on how specifically Hegel is and also was wrong in the notorious 166 paragraph of Philosophy of Right. There will be some overlap, of course, with earlier presentations, hard to avoid it now, uh, particularly with Jean-Baptiste, uh, uh, but yeah, bear with me, I just have to make sure we, that we know where I'm coming from when I move to the more contemporary examples. So obviously I too take Antigone as a role model of characteristic conflictual femininity in Hegel. However, as for Hegelian background, I want to put additional emphasis um, on the following that the Antigone is not strictly speaking the transitional figure from the Greek world to the world to the onwards to the Roman world. She is case of failure of Greek Zitlichkeit, but is not yet immediately the principle of its overcoming. The feminine principle is victorious in the ancient world, but this victory happens as a separate moment, as a revenge for earlier injury. So, to cite quickly again, to know where we are, the police creates itself the enemy in what it suppo suppresses. Um, it creates an enemy in the feminine itself. By intrigue, the feminine, the polity's eternal irony, uh, changes the government's universal purpose into a private purpose, transforms its universal activity into these determinate individuals work, etc. We heard that yesterday. Uh, now to explain uh, more detailly what happens here. Uh, I like to imagine things like as stupidly and picturesquely as possible. The, because the, 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 the dynamics that Hegel describes in following paragraphs is it's, it's quite specific. Uh, what Hegel seems to talk about here is an, you have to have an enthusiastic youth that tries to do something universal. And of course in antiquity uh, there is one universal thing you can do. You can risk your life in armed conflict. And, but insofar you are, as you are an ambitious young man, you want to prove yourself in this risk. So this is universal that is already tainted by individuality. And now we have also a figure of a woman, a mother, sister, wife, that sees in this action only the individual. Uh, and so she is the agent that affirms only the concrete individual aspect of this pretense of universal action. Um, so she says, you know, it's about you, you know, to hell with the universal. This is the evige ironie. Universal is simple, simply the means for affirmation of individuality. Uh, by the way, I think it's meaningful here that after all that he has earlier said about the brother-sister relationship here, he kind of moves the emphasis first on the, I think he gives primacy to mother-son relationship or husband-wife relationship. Uh, because if we follow Alexander Kozhev, who identifies the young man in the closing paragraphs of the Zitlichkeit chapter with Alexander the Great, then that would make this feminine figure Olympia, um, his mother, which who would fit the uh, character-wise with the description of Evigeroni and the intrigue. Um, okay, we could also imagine a wife in this position, a certain kind of Lady Macbeth character. Uh, but interestingly, I don't, uh, I don't find the brother-sister relationship to be that supportive of this kind of relationship of, let's say, female possessive investment into the, into the combative youth. So what happens that this coalition of women and eager combative youth constitutes a sort of um, hawkish pressure group within the police. They introduce an independent inclination to war uh, and, and then eventually prevail against the major, wis major wisdom, says Hegel. War introduces element of contingency, it, re it disrupts and eventually it destroys any, remain any remains of stabilizing harmonious communal universality. And so by the winner takes it all principle, uh, the universality is individualized to extreme into a single rural emperor. This is the Roman world. So what I take from this, there are two moments in the ancient world. <clears throat> the tragedy of Antigone is the moment where universality of police overrules blocks Antigone's attempt to raise the individuality to universal status, because this is the function of the funeral. But then the feminal principle takes successful revenge by separating universality with individuality. Um, okay, on to uh, philosophy of right. Uh, Hegel proceeds in paragraph 166 of philosophy of right 
right after he confines the women to, to substantial role in the family sphere, Hegel proceeds, as Rauko has already said, proceeds to mention Antigone as a positive example, and he sees no problem there. Um, implication is that while Antigone could not actualize, actualize her Empfinden der subjektive Substantialität, but the modern woman apparently for Hegel can. The problem is, it is not clear to me why should it be so. Why? Uh, because as we have seen, what tore apart the Greek Zitlichkeit was strictly was not the causa proxima of collapse, was not the principle of subject, subjective pre, freedom, but more precisely, precisely the exclusion of women from the universal and their confinement to the family. Um, so it's not very clear what, what changes into modern, in modern Zitlichkeit that would prevent this destructive development, uh, such as destructive developments. There is only one major change in modern Zitlichkeit, introduction of civil society between family and the state. But how, can we, how could we know that this successfully neutralizes the problem? The civil society is still, after all, in principle, a negation of family. The spheres are still in somewhat antagonistic relationship. So how can we be sure that there could not be some analogous scenario of conflict? Um, how can we be sure that the, there is no, no scenario where the family happiness will be disrupted and the feminine principle will be once again injured? Uh, because if such thing could happen, everything would be in place for the repetition for, of destructive scenario from antiquity. The state could once again create an enemy in women, and as we have already seen, this is not an enemy that the state can afford to make. <laughs> because, um, the woman must still fun function as a corruptive agent of irony against the universality of the state. In, particularly, uh, in particular, the families, the families that belong to universal class are more or less still in the same position as in antiquity. Um, the direct connection of family of the state. Uh, so, yeah, that would be, that would be sus susceptible to the same kind of corruption. Um, so, the mechanisms of instability uh, remain intact. Um, so, to sum up the lessons I take from this, um, in antiquity, Hegel shows how the feminine principle is progressive. Uh, progressive strictly in the sense it moves things forward. It does so because the woman does not believe in the clear separation between the individual and the universal. And she's correct in this regard, because men can only afford to believe in this separation because women are excluded from the public sphere, from the universal. And so they constitute the separated place of individuality. Um, and yes, as I said, I claim that Hegel does not sufficiently or clearly enough resolve this conflict in modern context. Uh, so we can already get from this account of fall of uh, Greek Zitlichkeit what, what would be the fault lines where the conflict could be, could be expected to emerge. Um, now, before I move to really to contemporary example, I have to address another point. Uh, I have to explain in what sense do I still hold the Hegel standpoint about the woman to be still relevant today. Namely, okay, we are discussing here, here Hegel and the woman question because we are Hegelian philosophers and feminists, and that's our job. But, I mean, we don't really need to discuss this. This is something that Hegel is wrong where we do already know this immediately. Uh, even if that question, let's say that this question was still someone, somewhat open for the spirit in Hegel's time, but since then, the spirit, let's say, has taken decisions that are incompatible with Hegel's account. Uh, I think Andrea Novakovic mentioned this in uh, her talk. Uh, she pointed out how the Hegel's argument for exclusion of women from public sphere were also used as an argument and could be used as an argument against the, against the female suffrage. So that's at least at somewhere around the points where suffrage became universal and it can extend it to women. Um, the Geist has taken a de de decisive position against Hegel, Hegelian account, and Hegelian account only works as a whole as soon as one point, uh, one attribute, one, one, one moment of, the, of his account of gender relations was uh, uh, refused, the whole thing does not work. Um, so, so how, so it, it, it's, it's right to ask how is this his argument contemporarily relevant, uh, I mean, how, 
Why should we read him as, uh, even, even as a target of critique today? Uh, well, I think maybe because we, 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 after all, haven't left his account entirely. Because while it's true that the guys at some point went on another path of conceiving the gender relations, uh, I guess that we did not quite arrive at the consistent solution to, 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 this, uh, to, to, to this question yet. So there are unresolved issues, um, mainly um, the natural difference between sexes in relation to, to bearing children. This is probably the most prominent one, and it's not really resolved in contemporary, uh, in contemporary Geist. And, uh, so it's not accounted for, let's say. Uh, and this is, let's say, one of the reasons why there still exists latently a possibility of conservative solution, conservative package of gender relations, um, still somehow persist in ethical life, it, which means that it is available to some people, to some environments, to some social milieus, to choose this, uh, to see this as a correct, right way of conceiving gender relations. Um, because it does solve certain issues that the liberal uh, mainstream, uh, mainstream conception of gender relations does not accept how the, the differences that are introduced by the fact that women have to bear kids. Um, so yeah, and Hegel is a good, Hegel's articulation of gender relations is, I guess, a good, a good I mean, a very detailed articulation of this conservative, uh, conservative solution to gender relations. And in that sense, it is still somewhat actual, half actual, in, also in contemporary world. That, that was one huge caveat. Um, so the women are not what Hegel makes of them anymore, but are also not completely not so. Yeah. Uh, OK, so with this background, we can now approach the second, the main part of my talk. Uh, we can now examine the key piece of evidence that I decided for the purpose of this paper to be somehow exemplary or at least highly indicative for the ethical significance of gender difference today. That is the emergence in recent couple of years of a rather popular meme, a stereotypical a derisive mocking stereotype of a woman named Karen. So to explain to those perhaps unacquainted, the internet culture functions through a process of, let's say, collective improvisation. It starts, for example, with one clever joke, one funny picture that sometimes gets taken up by, by others in some sort of improvisational repetition, and gradually an, uh, an idea forms, an idea that sometimes even becomes a fully developed character, uh, as was the case as is the case with Karen. Uh, now, I did some archaeology about this, this character. As far as I could figure out, it started with the observation that a certain type of haircut, inverted bob cut in technical language, is characteristic for a woman <laughs> with a certain social attitude. The, I want to speak to the manager haircut. Uh, it was only later that the name was attached to the concept. A bit randomly, but mostly by the virtue of, of the fact that the name Karen is characteristic of certain demographic. It peaked in incidence uh, with girls born around 1965, specifically white girls. So gradually, the character, of, the character of Karen was built. Entitled, assertive, demanding, white, middle-aged woman, most likely also a mother, that is inclined to rather merciless treatment of service workers and other socially weaker people she encounters. So then, in the context of uh, Black Lives Matter protests and conflicts, conflicts around, around it, uh, the racial component became increasingly prominent. So Karen came to denote a white woman who feels uh, excessively threatened by black people, black men, and is very quickly inclined to act on it, that is to call the cops. Then, especially in the corona era, uh, Karen also gained the attribute of very determined anti-vaxxer. Uh, and then we should also note that there is a good degree of flexibility to, the, to this meme, to this character. Initial, initially, as pointed out, it was a product of more left-wing circles. Uh, however, I've seen spins on the character that uh, ascribed it a uh, characteristic lip tart features, such as veganism. So in some appearances, she seems to take a more, she's more of a representative of uh, this uh, detached liberal kind of entitlement. So uh, the Karen phenomenon is, of course, 
not without toxicity on part of its creators. And no wonder then that also a range of suspicious commentators appeared uh, who are asking whether this aversion expressed in the Karen meme is not in fact only a thinly veiled sexism, uh, is not whiteness here merely a alibi, a license for the reproduction of most classical miso misogynic, misogynistic stereotypes. I will address this dilemma towards the end. Uh, now, let's just note that for us philosophers, the very emergence of such character should represent that, should already represent an indication that something of important conceptual value is going on here. Precisely because of the collective crowdsourced origin of this of Karen character, this already indicates that, it, that the idea must have hit something actual. Apparently, enough people share an experience uh, of meeting a Karen-like character so that the concept could stack on. But at the same time, of course, if there are enough, indeed enough cases of women exhibiting Karen-like behavior, this also means that there must be something actual and therefore rational to Karen Gesinnung. So, um, Yes, every systemic phenomenon has explanation and has also justification. So this already indicates some internal conflict within the ethical, which is therefore worth examining and explaining. Um, so I'll try to fix more precisely the crucial feature of the character. Um, Karen is uh, definitely a feminine fig figure. Not just in the sense that she, op that she happens to be female, but that she embodies an intrinsically gendered sort of behavior, a gendered sort of power or mode of access of power or claim to power. Um, with that, I mean that it is not the case that the critique and the mocking directed at, Ke at Karen would be based on a certain idea of what it is appropriate uh, to be a woman and that Karen would be someone that oversteps these boundaries. That would be the case of obvious and direct misogyny. Rather, what is derided and disliked in Karen's stereotype is proper to femininity itself. Um, proof with, with some browsing, one can easily find examples when a man is being labeled Karen. Uh, and this, of course, includes an, another level of la layer of the region. So, um, but yeah, this proves that the Karen is by concept feminine. Um, so, how and why? Now, to proceed with the analysis, um, of course, this rather nebulous collective authorship of the concept presents us with a bit of a problem because it can make the character a bit difficult to fix precisely. And we can only suspect that it's actually not a consistent character, it's more of a uh, improvised, improvised set of Wittgensteinian family resemblances, so it can develop. So I will have to avail myself with some simplification. I will fall back on the defining line of the Karen attitude. I want to speak to the manager, and I will try to answer what here is specifically feminine. feminine. Or rather, I will try to answer what is unmanly about it, which makes it easier to me to answer uh, because I can rely on my uh, immediate ethical knowledge. I think the, the answer would be something like uh, the recourse to authority is for a man already a display of weakness and failure because you should be able to get the person in question to bend to your will uh, purely with resources at your own disposal as a private person. And uh, ignore the chain of command. Uh, you should directly co-opt the opposing person. So by bribe, charm, beg your intimidation, but you know, not by demanding to speak to the manager. <laughs> uh, so I think it's a, and actually, I think this is a good point to develop a bit, uh, a, a bit further. Um, so to stay, to, to, to labor a while on this masculine side of the power. Uh, I think the, some clarification and demarcations are in order because I believe there is a pitfall, a possibility of misunderstanding uh, the male patriarchal, patriarchal form of social power in modernity. Uh, there will be some broad swipes here. Uh, I think we, ten we tend to think about paradigmatic, um, about social power with masculine features 
on the paradigm based on the models uh, on, of traditional figures of authority, the king, the general, the policeman, the priest. Uh, well, let's provisionally call this conception of power the power of the voice. So we imagine the social power as the power to cause something to be true simply by proclaiming it loudly and publicly. However, uh, is it not the case that such conception of power is still essentially premodern? It relies on givenness of authority, uh, that the words of certain people have this special ability to, be, to cause something to become real, either through position acquired by birth, by insignia uh, that one wears, by uniform one wears, uh, or by something more uh, and nebulous like charisma or literally powerful voice. In all cases, uh, this position of authority is given, it exists in advance. So I'm not claiming that such form of power is obsolete, but it is slightly anachronistic. So the modernity is, after all, based precisely on crit critique, on suspicion of precisely any form of given authority. So good chances are that actually existing power functions differently. Uh, I think we can see clear these functions of this idea of power, the, that this idea of power has suffered throughout modernity, and increasingly more in recent times. Because the more intense the social communications and the more multidirectional, the more precarious this power of the voice becomes. It, it gets drowned in general cacophony. Um, example of Elon Musk Twitter fiasco is a good illustration. So we have a man that is by all metrics an exemplary uh, embodiment of uh, masculine social power, except that he tries a bit too hard. And now he also tries to take the stage and to capture the, the main public forum of contemporary world Twitter but uh, the results are, let's say, less than impressive. So we constantly see figures of authority disintegrating as soon as they step into the limelight. Um, so if we see examples of a, this kind of pre-given authority in decline, maybe something else must describe the functioning of power better. We need another paradigm. So I would suggest that the relevant form of modern power is a much more much more essentially a private affair. So this is the power that functions at the level of civil society. Uh, now, this is a level analysis that Hegel never quite got to, namely that because he never really recognized that civil society is also an arena of asymmetrical relations, that is, of power relations. So, and these unequal power relations within civil society must still be constituted by the means that are proper to sphere of civil society, that is, uh, instrumental exchange relations between nominally independent and autonomous persons. Um, so I'm saying that to grasp this relevant, the actually existing social power, even in masculine form, we have to imagine something much more, so much more like a soft power. It involves making people do things uh, or behave as you want them to do, in spite of them being independent free agents. So it has much more to do with manipulation, with the handling of the particular. A man has to do stuff now. Um, he cannot rely on some direct privileged access to universal, so uh, to the laws and to binding orders. Uh, one good illustration I can find is um, from the movie A Good Boss, a recent movie, um, Spanish. Um, the main character, played by Javier Bardem, he holds power over a company and local community in Spanish town, and he does so mostly by handling them. Bribe, exchange of favors, intimidation, extor extortion, charm, etc. Uh, notably, uh, he, cannot, uh, he cannot rely on the support of the universal power structures anymore. Um, the, police are, the police are not what they used to be, so when he calls them at some point to get a favor from them, they just explain him that what he demands is outside of his jurisdiction. So he has to arrange uh, the law enforcement himself. Um, and the movie plays on the metaphor of scales and balance, right? because he, the company produces introduction, industrial scales. So the balance must be kept, uh, universality. Uh, the particular has to be carefully handed in order that, is not, that it does not disrupt the precarious balance of universality. Towards the end of the movie, 
As this balance and the position of power of the main character are growing ever more challenged and precarious, he nicely sums up the credo. Sometimes the scales must be tricked in order to get the correct weight. So we could rephrase the universality must be upheld by decidedly non-universal means. Uh, we could also say, I'll go also go into this because the association is rather clear, we could say that the power that I'm describing is in fact um, the art of making a deal. However, we would quickly have to add that um, you know, Trump is not an example of this, but a caricature, because art of making a deal is precisely not of winning in the competition of deal making, which is how the Trump sort of seemed to imagine this, that you, know, you make the best deals and then you become the president. Uh, because the art of the, the real art of deal is precisely before any universal measure that would even allow for comparison. It creates the universal. It does not it is not a gesture within the universal. Um, so where I'm going there, I think now the difference with the Karen-like behavior with characteristic recourse to authority has become totally clear. Uh, a brief theorem, the difference between masculine and the feminine in contemporary <clears throat> ethical life is that it is humiliating for a man to trust the universality, trust the order. The ideal man has a task to enact the universal uh, to channel the universal. So, the final diagnosis and evaluation of Karen character and Karen-like behavior. When I started out with this exploration for this paper, I started out with a, some vague idea that the phenomenon of Karen could be somehow conceptually related to the, this Hegelian female characters, either Antigone or Evigeironi. But in the end, it turned out to be quite well different. Uh, OK, the, as a, the expected part is that Karen does seem to be characterized by some, by some conflation of individual and universal. Because that is what entitlement means. Uh, and you could also detect some features that would bring her in a conceptual vicinity of Antigone, uh, of Antigone type conviction. Uh, I mentioned the idea that Karens are anti-vaxxers, for example. However, I feel that that aspect is today not so specifically gendered, because, okay, if we generalize Antigone-like disposition as this fervent insistence on the right of individuality against the existing universal, Eigenzin, uh, then we would certainly find no lack of Antigone's of both genders today. But this is, I think, separate phenomenon. So anti-vaxxers and other types, of, other types of rebellion against the universality, definitely very important and defining contemporary phenomenon, but it's not very specifically part of the Karen character that much. Um, what is specific and uh, characteristic is that she's definitely not ironic. On the contrary, she's, Karen is a, feature, is a figure of excessive trust in the universality, in the structures of power, and uh, in trust that the structures of power and authority are on her side. So, and it is precisely the immediate and quick recourse to these structures that constitutes the most characteristics and also the most ridiculed and the most hateable aspect of the character. Um, however, um, compared to the proposed image of ideal male behavior, it can become more obvious how such Karen-like behavior is also a sign of deprivation of power. The recourse to existing hierarchies, to repressive apparatuses of the state, can also be an expression of frustration or lack of capacity to arrange things yourself. So in the end, we can conclude that yes, there is a certain level of misogyny present in phenomenon of Karen, perhaps unintentionally because it depends on what is made visible and what remains invisible. So the Karens of the world are exaggerated villains, villains, victims of their intermediate position, a combination of certain level of entitlement but without effective means of, um, <clears throat> of private power. Uh, they quickly lean on the system and openly display its violence and its hierarchies, whereas a man could arrange the same things as a private person and hence more smoothly, less visibly, with less apparent violence. 
so how to plug this all back into the Hegelian framework? Um, we can detect, detect in Karen, in Karen case, a dysfunction that is a conse consequence of complications of, of passage between the spheres of family, civil society, and the state. It can be read as an indication, a symptom of how women are not full members of, or fully empowered or fully equipped members of civil society yet. Um, uh, and therefore, they appear as an, this intrusive nexus of family and state within the civil society. Okay, this is how far I've got. I feel there is quite more, a lot could be said in this direction. But yes, it will have to remain for some other time. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, questions, comments, observations, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I didn't know the Karen character, character as I told you already yesterday, so uh, I had fun. <laughs> but, um, uh, well, I was just wondering, how about class? Uh, and, yes. and Karen, because, um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that this, was something uh, uh, that I w was wondering about. Mm -hmm. And also, when you think about, well, I have difficulties, to be honest, to, uh, to, to see the parallels to Antigone. I think I got mm -hmm. your point at the end, but mm -hmm. when I think about class and Karen, because, mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't know the pictures and all mm -hmm. the, that's going on in the social media, mm -hmm. so I just have, if I have a picture now, I have uh, definitely a bourgeois uh, mm -hmm. woman in my mind, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, does that matter to you at all? And also in the discussion of women and... Um, yes. The question is: She actually is it a sign of her power or mm -hmm. her um, not being in power as as a woman? Um, mm -hmm. Because if, if it's a class thing, then she's both at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, yes, it's not uh, it's not explicitly the part of the character to to have her class defined. And as I said, it can move a bit, but uh, by default, yes middle class, upper middle class, I would say. And uh, I, I think that it's not, it's not clear about the character whether, she's, uh, whether she works or whether she's housewife. That, that's ambiguous. So that's a, that's a blind spot of the character it's, it's happened. It's, it's also characteristic. Uh, but yes, about the power, yes, it's precisely because it's intermediate. I mean, mm, yeah, she's, yes, a person, a, 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 a position of intermediate power, let's say, that, like that. Uh, not the lowest, but uh, not, but so, but not independent, and not really an independent actor in that sense. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, go back to the Antigone. Mm. <laughs> I really like this play, so I am insisting on it. <laughs> right. But um, you talk about uh, this, uh, when Hegel, Hegel brings Antigone in the phenomenology of spirit, yes. uh, and there he is talking about the ancient uh, family or ancient family and ancient state, and police, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he brings back in the modernity, yes. the same character, mm -hmm. there was an ancient character mm -hmm. in the context of modernity. Mm -hmm. And he brings it back because of this concept of pity. Mm -hmm. And I would like to understand how do you see it, this, this ancient mm -hmm. uh, model, so to say, it's not exactly a model, but well, uh, again in modernity mm -hmm. to justify a completely different mm -hmm. um, model of, of woman mm -hmm. and uh, this concept of piety and if it works with your whole um, current idea um, and so <laughs> thank you uh, yes uh, no i haven't really thought about <laughs> that i'm I, no, I, I don't think it works with Karen, and I, and I also don't think it works with Antigone. I mean, this is uh, uh, in the modernity. I think. Uh, I mean that the okay. No, you, she's an example of pity, but uh, Hegel does not explain why. Why? Why does? Why would this work for her in modernity better than it did than it did in antiquity? 
at least it's not sufficiently clear to me. Uh, so, but that this is what Hegel appears to want to do, but I don't think he he convinces us. Uh, uh, I have a question. <laughs> Yeah, but I. Okay, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Um, I um, identified myself with the position of asking a question. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. Um, I have actually. This is. The first thing is a small comment, <laughs> um, more of a kind of plea for thinking. And uh, a second one is, well, uh, just a question, a regular question. Uh, so, um, well, I really f um, like the point you raised regard of what is left of Hegel's horrid descriptions of women in contemporary Geist. Um, and I mean, the way we could use this so uh, we well you basically claim we we did move on in modernity yes. and yet we did not uh, since hegel's description still hold in relation to conservative approaches to gender logic and politics so what does this tell us this is like a kind of comment and a question i'm interested to hear uh, what you have to say about it so first for me, well, if Hegel depicted well, then this means he taught it well. So maybe we are being, you know, just to, uh, I, I, this is a, just a suggestion, mm -hmm. to unmodest to think that ha we have solved it all, mm -hmm. you know, as Goethe said, uh, all good things have been taught and yet we have to think them once again. <laughs> so, well, this is not to say that we should, you know, take Hegel as an ultimate figure of authority, but the way I see it is that it kind of reveals that in the matter um, of, of thought, we, we have to, um, uh, well, evoke dedication, hard working, and why not um, some kind of, um, Yes, suffering that thinking requires. Um, so this is a kind of a plea for thinking that I um, abstracted from, from uh, your um, uh, notice. And uh, this is how I also understand this conference to be, to, to go into this direction. And the, 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 uh, the other question is, well, um, I was wondering if Karen, uh, um, in its intermediary position, you know, being independent, uh, uh, being um, quasi-independent mm -hmm. and, and yet dependent at the same time, how could this figure be applied to, um, the, the, I would really like to hear what you have to say about this, in relation to women in intellectual production at universities. I do, want, do not want to speak about this because it could take days, but you are a colleague of mine, and, uh, uh, so I would really like to hear it. I mean, this is a, a bit, um, maybe I'm you putting you in a difficult <laughs> position, but uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So. <laughs> okay, first the, the, the easy parts, uh, comments on comment. Uh, so yes, uh, to clarify, we, I think we moved on, self-consciously guys has moved on, but there are still underlying pressures that are not well absorbed. Right? Okay. Um, Why? <laughs> uh, I, I'm thinking about things, I mean, they, I will not tell anything, but I'm thinking about, no. They, uh, like, uh, well, if you want to have a family and then the woman has to, has to have kids and then she drops yeah. out of career, how to manage career and family because the self-consciously guy just ignores this mostly. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in US pretty much totally, but um, so it pretends it doesn't happen. And um, so there is some underlying actuality that disrupts what guys thinks of himself, this self-consciously. Uh, how, <laughs> how do we know that we are better than Hegel here? Uh, I think that, well, not necessarily better, but I think we are far enough on this path that it's, uh, I think it's, it, I think it has a form of decision and mm -hmm. that it's uh, irreversible. 
So, I mean, <laughs> okay, maybe it was the wrong direction, <laughs> but that just means that we'll eventually, what, fail as uh, <laughs> civilization. But, well, we cannot, like, discover that, uh, whoopsie, I mean, that we will, uh, uh, we should go back. So I really think, I mean, I do not have any good argument for this, but I think that developments like uh, uh, Handmaid's Tale and, uh, or, uh, or uh, Albeck's Soumission, that they are not possible ethically, because um, uh, that you simply cannot put women women back into uh, into yeah. the previous position, because it does not work for women. Um, yes, uh, intellectual labor of the university and Karen. And Karen. Uh, well. Hmm. <laughs> Well, the, the problem is that, that the, 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 it's not a very applicable concept because the work the university is supposed to happen within the medium universe of universality as such. Mm -hmm. And while Karen is... Supposed to <laughs> but, uh, take uh, universities in contemporary guise, so it's, tell me how much universality well, is left. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I no, I would say that pres here precisely the, the opposition is not that great because what I was developing is the the, the differences big in civil society when you have more more of this um, uh, yes the, the the male propensity to act without the coverage of universality. Uh, <laughs> under the rules, independently of the rules, against the rules. Um, whereas, let's say that the university is more of a, has a tighter grip mm -hmm. on the, uh, than the civil society does. In that sense, yeah, yeah, it's okay, medium okay, universality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, it's not, the, the difference is not that mm -hmm. specific. So, yeah. So we are basically I think, not I think answering. I'm answering. I'm answering that the Karen phenomenon is not that visible because it's not this okay. distinctive in the university. Okay, good. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, where's the microphone? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this strange uh, lecture. <laughs> I really liked it. But we, all, we already talked about uh, this Karen phenomena, phenomena before, because this is not a phenomena from now. The, mm -hmm. In the 90s, the phenomena was called Becky. Mm -hmm. And in Becky was like the white person who knows mm -hmm. her whiteness, but uses her whiteness for mm -hmm. her own benefit. And before that, in Hegel's times, mm -hmm. uh, this phenomena was called Miss Anne. Mm -hmm. In the antebellum times, Miss Anne was like the slave owner mm -hmm. who used her whiteness oppress the black people for her own benefits. So there is some history behind it. So Karen is not like, uh, okay, it is a meme, but it's, it is a phenomena mm -hmm. which is present mm -hmm. for centuries, I'd mm -hmm. say. Even in colonial times, there's supposed to be some formal Karen. So my question is just like, what is happening with this phenomena, this figure of uh, a woman who knows her own systematic role and uses her systematic role to engage with the oppressed people, in a sense. Mm, yes, uh, I mean, of course, no. It's also the also the, the 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 theory, the theoretical explanation that I came up with is not really specific to modern times. So it's 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 uh, yeah, it's completely yeah, it's obvious that it can describe a, um, uh, a character living through a, a characteristic character that is for a broader time period. Um, because, yes, essentially, uh, the conceptual requirements are just the incomplete emancipation of women, and they're, as soon as they have some kind of access to the pub, the civil society, and not the adequate means to, to, uh, to, to engage in civil society, we can we can expect that some uh, uh, Karen-type intrusive behavior will 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 fall. So it's a, it's a, it's a yes. That's that's a it's a bit evic evic phenomenon itself because the, yes, there is always this uh, um, the position of women of women on higher up on the social uh, on the social uh, scale is contradictory in this regard, and so they will. 
appear as a more obvious, um, well, precisely because they're, they're of their contradictory position, their claim to power will, will appear more intrusive, less recognized, uh, less, less welcome. It also indicates, well, they can be object of mocking and derision because people who do it can afford it. So it's, again, a rel only a relative power. So it, you will not attack the one who, will, who can seriously hurt you. In this sense, so they, they are pure, they just, they just exemplify pure social status without the means of, the hierarchy without the means of enforcing it. And therefore, they are, in, they are really good and hated. Because the, 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 yes, they don't have legi legitimacy in, in this sense. Okay, um, so if we do not have any questions left.